How's everyone doing today? You doing good? Is my audio okay? I'm, I'm using these mics here because, you know, you got those little lavalier mics, and I've got this thing, this in the way. I actually uh, did this, uh, <laughs> this is totally unrelated to this talk, but I did a, um, I used ResNet image classification. I built a bunch of stuff around that uh, just to take random images from the internet and classify them, and I'd go from axolotls to zucchinis, uh, which I think has a different word here, and I can't remember it. Is it courgette? Yeah, courgette. See, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. But anyhow, so I put my picture in, and it said that I was a fur coat. <laughs> anyhow, AI's going to take over the world. So uh, welcome to Dungeons, Dragons, and Graph Databases. My name is Guy Royce. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Redis. There are three things on this slide that matter. One of them matters to you. One of them matters to me. And one of them matters to my boss. Any guess what the thing is that matters to my boss? Oh, wait, can I get, there we go. That right there, yeah, the Redis logo. So uh, we uh, want you all to know that Redis is more than just a cache. It has more than strings. You can do more than getting set. I'm going to show you a little bit of Redis today. Uh, most of my talks about graph databases and the Cypher query language, but my demos will be using Redis Graph because there's a graph database that you can use with Redis. There's the thing that I care about. That's that Twitter ID. I judge my value as a human based on how many people follow me on Twitter. So uh, please help monetize my narcissism, and thank you. And the thing that you care about is that github.com slash Guy Royce. So I've got a bunch of code that I updated this morning. I'm sure that will end well. And uh, it's all out there on GitHub. All these slides, all the code, all the, all the resources are out there on GitHub. So if you want to try this stuff out yourself, that's where you can go. And yes, I do have guy.dev as a domain name. So if there's any other people out there named Guy that want lastname.guy.dev, I'll be happy to give you a subdomain. And uh, in addition to being a developer advocate, I'm also a fan of Dungeons and Dragons. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since, um, since Reagan was president, <laughs> since the early 80s. Um, I've been doing it a long time. And so I thought I would show my character sheet. Uh, there, so there's me. I, I'm neutral good. So uh, at least I think I am. I, I guess if I was neutral evil, I might think I was neutral good. I don't know. Uh, but I'm uh, a bard was the closest thing I could come up with for developer advocate. Um, obviously a dwarf or a wizard, one or the other. Um, level five, armor class of 11. You might notice if you play a lot of D&D that my armor class is 11. I'm not, I'm not wearing armor, uh, and, uh, but my dexterity is an eight. So this means I, what it is is that as a developer advocate, I've got a plus two bonus to armor just because I have a tough hide. And that comes from uh, being a public speaker. And so you suffer those slings and arrows, you build a thick, thick hide. So um, my abilities are over here on the right. Uh, of note are the intelligence and the wisdom of eight and the charisma of 16 which tells you everything you need to know about what you're going to get today, which is <laughs> all sizzle, no steak. <laughs> but as a D&D &D player and as a person who runs D&D &D games in general, but particularly as a player, uh, I like to maximize my, my gaming potential. I want, to, you know, I want to level up faster. I want to get the gold. I want to defeat the monster. This is my problem. How do I go to the dungeon and get those the most efficient way possible? I want to find the rooms in the dungeon that have the things that I care about. Things like monsters that are of an appropriate experience level for a challenge rating for me to defeat, but give me the experience I need to increase my character's level and has the best treasure. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm a developer advocate, I'm a D&D &D player, but I'm also a developer. And so I'm like, I could build a database and I could put the dungeon in the database, and then I could query the dungeon, query that database, and find out which rooms I should go to first. And I could use a relational database to do that, right? I could have a rooms table with a big schema and a treasures table and a monsters table, or I could use a graph database with nodes and relationships. And I'm guessing, I'm assuming, but we'll do a show of hands anyhow, just to shame the few people that this won't be true of, uh, is how many of you have used a relational database in your career? Exactly. 
How many of you have used a graph database? OK, a few of you. Um, the whole point of this talk is to take a relational database, compare it against a graph database, show how they can be similar, show where they're different. So how do I solve similar sets of problems? And so for those of you who didn't raise your hand about having used a graph database, there's probably a question in your head, which is, what's a graph database? There's probably a small number of you in here that said, oh, I thought this was going to be a talk about GraphQL. It happens every time I give this talk, actually. This is not a talk about GraphQL. GraphQL is a different thing entirely. Uh, but that doesn't mean you should run away, because graph databases are really, really cool. But in order to answer what a graph database is, there's a little bit of, what the heck's a graph? I mean, it's not something that my manager just generates, right? Uh, to, to see, you know, it's not, it's not a burn down chart, right? Uh, what's a graph? Well, uh, a graph is a set of nodes or vertices connected by edges or relationships. And as soon as you see them, you're going to recognize them for what they are. They can represent all sorts of things, like a social graph would be, for example, that uh, I follow you on Twitter, and then you follow me. There is a graph, because you just followed me, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that's a graph. There's a, there, uh, we're the nodes, and that follow is the relationship. Or it could be like a, like a, like a genealogical relationship, like a, a, your family tree is a graph. For me, it's more of a family web, but you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, and so a, uh, a family tree has like, you know, there's a, there's a mom and a dad, and they get together and, you know, do what they do. <laughs> He said awkwardly. <laughs> um, but so, you, you know, there's a, a relationship there. The people are the nodes. Traffic systems work this way. Bus stops are nodes. Uh, but it can also be things like objects. This 20 sided die is a graph. The points are the vertices. The edges are, well, they're the edges, <laughs> right? And so uh, this is, I think, worth noting because it shows that the graph is, it's not bound. Like we tend to draw our graphs on pieces of paper and then we draw circles and lines and connecting them and stuff. But they're not bound by two dimensions or convenience of being put on a piece of paper. They can be three dimensional, they can be n dimensional, it doesn't matter. Um, but the whole idea of a graph is an abstraction around these things that have points or nodes and the connections between them. The simplest of a graph is a null graph. Thank you for attending my TED talk. Null graph, uh, some mathematicians, I am told, because I read a Wikipedia article, uh, argue as to whether a null graph is a real graph or not. You know, who cares? <laughs> Let's add some nodes. <laughs> They may be technically correct, and as we all know, technically correct is the best kind of correct. But um, this is a graph. Uh, it has several nodes. It doesn't have any relationships, but it's still a graph. We can put some relationships to those nodes, and now we, we get a graph where we can start kind of talking about it a little bit. Um, this graph has relationships connecting them. It's got pieces that aren't connected. Like we've got node E out here, it's all by its lonesome. It's isolated. And so when a portion of your graph is disconnected from the larger graph, or from the, the totality of the graph, the full graph, it's isolated. And uh, this subgraph here, nodes B and F, best friends forever, uh, are isolated, but they're related to each other. They're connected to each other. So they're isolated, but they're still, they do have a relationship. And even what you would think of as the main part of the graph is actually isolated because it's not connected to the full graph. If you connect all the nodes, you've got what's called a connected graph. So this connected graph is got nodes. They're not all fully connected, because, but there's a path. So I can get from node D to node C by way of A and B, or just by way of node A. A fully connected graph, I, I don't have a separate fully connected graph picture here, but I have a, I've, I've grayed out the rest of the graph. And the subgraph is fully connected. And that means that every node is connected to every node. 
If you've ever seen one of those network diagrams, the big star, it's the big star and it's, you know, the, every single thing connects across you know, the cords going across the big circle. That is a fully connected graph. That, that whole n times n minus one calculation to get the number of uh, connections in a network, that's the formula for the number of connections in a fully connected graph. The uh, graphs I've been showing you here are undirected. And I, I always try to think of another way to describe this, but I always fail. Um, no, graphs that are undirected do not have any directionality, which is not a useful definition. But what it means is there's no arrows, <laughs> in essence. So you can have an extra bit of information that says this is a connection from to. So in the following example I gave earlier, where if, if I follow you on Twitter, that's a directed relationship. And then you following me on Twitter is a directed relationship in the other direction. For the family example that I used earlier, um, there's a natural direction to that relationship, right? Uh, you know, my mother bore me, not the other way around. And so that has a natural direction. Um, streets, if you were building a transportation network, that has directionality. <laughs> it's a one-way road, right? Um, and so uh, a lot of dra graphs are directed. It's just a little bit of extra information. When we talk about the nodes of a graph, we can describe them with degrees. The degree of a node is how many relationships it has. If you have a directed graph, you can have out degrees, which is just the number of relationships that are outbound, and in degrees, which is the number of relationships that are inbound. And I, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but there really aren't any rules here. Anything can connect to anything. So uh, in this particular graph here, I have uh, nodes A and C connecting bidirectionally to each other. That follows, follows back relationship. Uh, node A has actually got a relationship to itself. <laughs> You're trolling me. <laughs> um, and so they can kind of go wherever. And, and this has been neatly put out on a two-dimensional surface so that it looks good on screen. But, you know, node B can connect to node E without having to draw a big loop around. Right? It's, just, it's just the nature of the relationship. A graph database, then, which was our original question, is a, uh, when, you put a when you put data on top of this structure. And so the nodes aren't just these nodes with letters that don't mean anything. They actually become elements in your data. So in this case, they become uh, rooms, and they become monsters, and they become treasure. And so you give them a label. And so this node is a room. This node is a monster. This node is a treasure. And then you can associate attributes with those nodes as well, other than just the label of what it is. So if we look here closely, we'll see that uh, uh, we have two monsters, Alice the Elf, uh, that has a name. She has an ID of four, challenge rating of seven, and is worth 350 experience points if I slay her. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have Bob the Ogre. There's data associated with that as well. Uh, fun fact, well, sort of a fun fact. My grandparents were named Alice and Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought it was really weird that it's sort of like the stock personas that you always use it for examples when you're doing talks and software and everything. It's like, those are my grandparents' names. <laughs> and, and yes, my, my grandmother was a bit elfin, but no, my grandfather was not ogre-like. So he was a very nice old man. Um, not only can you put the data on the nodes, but the relationships have a type. Like the room contains a monster or the room leads to another room or I follow someone on Twitter. And those relationships can have data associated with them beyond just their type. So you can do the same name value pair data on those as well. And that gives you a database worthy of Mordor. So nodes in a graph and in a graph database, they represent items generally. I tend to think that they're nouns. Strictly speaking, that doesn't have to be true, but I find they tend to be nouns. Uh, they can have labels, multiple labels, and they have attributes. And they can just be by themselves floating in space. They don't have to have any relationships. Relationships represent a connection and connect two nodes. 
They have a type and they have a direction. And they can also have attributes. Uh, but, and I think this is important. If you delete a node, its relationships go away. So, uh, because by definition, a relationship is, has two nodes on either end. Two points determine a line. You take a point away, you don't have a line anymore. And so, they tend to read like sentences with transitive verbs. The room contains a monster. The room contains a treasure. I suppose you could flip the directionality of this and have uh, the monster is contained by a room. But uh, my English teacher told me that the passive voice was to be avoided. So we won't do that. So that's graph theory in like, what, 10 minutes? <laughs> Enough, enough graph theory. Let's actually do something real with this. Because I've still got my problem. I still need to find the rooms that I need to go to to get the gold and to get the experience so that I can level up my character. And I still have to make a decision on how I'm going to solve it. Spoiler alert, it's going to be graph databases. <laughs> uh, am I going to use a relational database or am I going to use a graph database? And so when we talk to a relational database, there's a query language we use. Anyone know what it is? Everyone knows what it is, right? The real question is, is it pronounced SQL or SQL? <laughs> uh, yes, that is the correct answer. Yes, I pronounce it both ways. So when we talk to a relational database, if we're not using an ORM, which is pretty much what everyone always says nowadays, um, you use SQL. This is um, actually, I learned SQL in college back in 1990 something, like one or two. And um, it's the only programming language I still use on occasion that I learned back then. So it's, it's, it's still there. We all know it. It's the language we use to talk to relational databases. There are a couple languages for talking to graph databases as well. The one we're gonna look at today is Cypher. Uh, Cypher was created by Neo4j, who open sourced it. Uh, Redis used that open source uh, language spec to build the query language for Redis Graph. And uh, you're probably studying that syntax down there intently and wondering, what is this all about? Um, I think Cypher is kind of like, and, and we're going to get into the details here, but the way I, uh, it was described to me when I first saw it, when, when it was introduced to me, was like a cross between ASCII art and a query language. Because if you look at that thing after match there, it's, it's ASCII art representing the graph. So we'll look at that more closely. These matchers, these pattern matchers, they match, they, they look like what they are. Like, like this bit here, that matches a room node, a room with a label of node, and assigns it to a variable R that we get, so we can refer to it later in the query. And it's got parentheses on it, like it's round. It's the, way, it's the way I drew the picture up there. The monster, same thing. This matches a monster, a monster node. Signs it to a variable M. And then the relationship here, it's an arrow. It's pointing. It's showing the direction of this relationship. And it's got the label on it, which is contains, and assigns it to variable C. And so what these matchers do is they'll go across the entire graph, and wherever there is a room that contains a monster, it will match it. And so if I use the, the query I had here earlier, match treasure contains a room, room contains a monster, or the room contains the treasure and a monster is what that query is doing. Um, it's going to match all those instances in the database that have that pattern. So this match, query here would give me all the rooms in the graph that contain both a treasure and a monster, and then return them. And so that's, that's what these matchers do, they match. If you've ever done something with like, uh, like Rust or Elixir where they've got these, these like switch-like statements that have various pattern matchers, it's kind of the same idea, but against the entire graph. So let's go through all the CRUD operations uh, with, uh, with Cypher and with SQL. So if I want to create a room, 
for my database of dungeons. If I'm using SQL, assuming we have a table already, we just insert into it. We know this. The equivalent uh, call in uh, uh, Cypher would be to call create, and then I pass it a node. I pass it the curly braces, or not the curly braces, the, uh, the parentheses, which says a node. And I say, create me a node and give it a label of room. And assign it to the variable R so we can mess with it later in the query. And then after I've created it, I call set, and I can just set properties on it. And so one key difference here that you can see already is that in a relational database, I've got a schema, right? My table has columns defined ahead of time. In graph, that's in, in, in Redis graph and in Neo4j for that matter, that's uh, not true. Uh, I can set any properties I want on there. I'm happening, I happen to be setting the ID and the name, but you can set anything you want there. And they can vary from node to node, even though they have the same label. So there's, it's schema-less. But that's the syntax for creating a node and assigning some properties on it. Now that we've created something, let's read it. We all know uh, how, how to read things from uh, relational databases. Select star from users where clue greater than zero. Uh-oh, zero rows returned. To match, uh, to query nodes in a Redis graph or in a graph database with Cypher, we use the match command. And so that's gonna match on that pattern. So this is gonna match everything that's a room, it's got a room label. And then we're gonna filter that through a where clause where their ID is equal to the ID we care about, and we're gonna return it. So far, it's nothing shockingly difficult here. What's interesting here, I think, and, and one of the things I kind of like about Cypher, is this match where pattern gets repeated. In this case, we're matching, and then we're filtering, and then we're returning. But if we wanna update a room, in SQL, our syntax is different. In graph, it's mostly the same. We're gonna match where, we're gonna find and filter. And then we're gonna set the property. So the statue room is getting an update to a statue hall. And so we match a room where the idea is one, we can return it, we can set it, and we can delete it. Deletion, my favorite command. <laughs> Delete from rooms where ID equals one. How many have ever accidentally done that in production? <laughs> not, not, no. <laughs> to do the uh, comparable action in, in Cypher, again, it's match where, but instead of setting it, instead of returning it, we delete it. Everyone tracking so far? Good. I'm probably going a little too slow, actually. I was like, yes, yes, you are. <laughs> um, there's a, a variation in this syntax here. Uh, I've been using this match where syntax. I, I kind of drilled it down, uh, kind of drilled it in, and I kind of hit you over the head with it a little bit. Uh, you can also uh, inline all that. So here uh, we're matching a node, all nodes in the graph, where uh, they have a label of room, and they have in curly braces these properties that match. So this is matching where the ID is one. You could put additional properties in here and say it's like where a common name is equal to some other thing. And, and the syntax actually inside of those curly races is exactly the syntax you would use if you were like defining an object in JavaScript. Not JSON, but JavaScript specifically. So the strings go in quotes, the numbers don't, that sort of thing. So that's another way you can do that. You can also do that when you're creating. So I created a room and then I set properties on it but you can actually create a node and provide the properties you want all in one motion. So this is creating a room with an ID and a name. And uh, you'll note that on this particular one, there's not an R in front of room because I don't need to refer to it. So I don't need to assign it to a variable. And so uh, we already did dungeons rooms of the dungeon. We can create monsters the same way. Here I'm using uh, that new syntax to create a monster. And here I'm using uh, actually both syntaxes. You can mix and match them together. So I'm, 
creating a treasure, giving it a couple of properties and setting additional properties on it. Um, but it still works the same. So this is our relational database so far. We've got three tables with rows in them. Here's our graph database so far. We've got some nodes floating out there in space. So far, we haven't done anything with a relational database or with a graph database that we can't do with a relational database. Let's look at connecting these things together. Let's put a monster in a room. I think NC NDC may have done that already. I'm here on stage, so. <laughs> First thing we gotta do to put a monster in a room. We have to alter our table if we're doing a relational database. And then we have to create, uh, update the properties of that table to create those relationships. So we're creating a one-to-many relationship. You know, a monster has one room. Each room has many monsters. We've done this pattern a million times in relational databases. How do we do this with graph? Like this. You uh, match the room, you match the monster, and then referencing those variables, you can create a relationship between them. So you can create thing I know about R contains thing I know about M. There's a temptation to create to, to, in those create statements, to want to try and match. Don't do that. If you do that, you'll create new nodes with the same properties. So you've got to match the things you want to connect together first. You can do this all as one statement. I could say create r colon room with a bunch of properties, contains m colon monster with a bunch of properties, and I can create it all in one fell swoop. Uh, but if you have existing nodes, you have to find them and reference them first, and then you can uh, create relationships between them. But this puts a monster in a room. And because I'm a bit of a completionist, we have a slide for treasure as well, which works exactly the same way. And when you put treasure in the room, it's the same thing, except now my text is golden instead of red. So this is our relational database now. We've got a room. It's got a couple of one-to-many's hanging off of it. This is our graph database. We've got uh, some isolate, all the rooms are isolated, right? So we've got a room, it contains a monster, or it contains a treasure, or it contains both. But these rooms are, are isolated, these little subgraphs are isolated from each other. But it's enough that we can do some interesting queries. Munchkin time. We can find out which rooms have the most suitable monsters and which rooms have the most suitable treasures. So if we wanted to, for example, farm all the XP, find the rooms that have the most, the, the best monster, the monsters that are worth the most experience points. If we're doing that in a relational database. We do a classic join, select the uh, ID and name of the room, the experience of the monster. From the rooms and the monsters, join them with a simple where, there are other better ways, uh, and order them descending. Um, that will give us a nice ordered list, a priority list of monsters to go and slay. How do, you do with this, this, how do we do this with graph? Well, we can match all the rooms that contain monsters. And that will go through the graph and find every room that contains a monster. If a room contains two monsters, you'll get two results. Room, monster one, room, monster two. And then we return those same values, the ID, the name, the experience points, and we can order them. The rest of this actually looks kind of SQL-like, honestly. Uh, we can order um, it by that experience value descending. So the biggest is at the top. We go and we got a priority list. Same thing for the gold. Again, I'm a completionist. So, so far, so good, right? But so what? I haven't done anything with a graph database that you can't do just as easily with a relational database. Except maybe it's schema-less, which may or may not be a better thing depending on whether you like JavaScript or TypeScript. 
Them's fighting words, aren't they? <laughs> well, this is where the graph gets interesting because what happens when I want to connect the rooms together? And that's a more interesting problem. Anyone ever done use CTE in, in uh, SQL? Was it fun? Well, maybe for varying values of fun, yeah. Um, how do we connect rooms to rooms in a relational database? By creating a mapping table. You got a many-to-many -many relationship. Now, rooms connect to rooms, and so this is just a, it's actually a table that represents the graph because you've got a table of connections between rooms and you insert into them. So uh, the first row says room one, uh, connects to room one. Second row says that room one connects to room two. And then there's a corresponding room two connects to room one. And so you just create a table that's got all of these relationships in it, saying this node goes to this node, this node goes to this node. And then when you go to query it, well, you need to use CTE. <laughs> How do we connect rooms in, Redis, in, in, in a graph database, like, with, like Redis Graph? How do we connect these rooms using Cypher? It's exactly the same way we put the monsters in the room. It's exactly the same way we put the treasures in the room. Because the graph database doesn't care what the nodes are. Any node can be related to any node, regardless of whether they are of the same type or different types. This is why like, social media is a great example, but it's kind of a cliched example for graph databases. Because like, um, you, you can like a thing, right? And that's a relationship. Guy liked this post. But I can also like comments on posts. And those are, you know, you can think of those as different nodes in a graph. But the relationship's the same type because it's just, it doesn't care. And so here we just match room one, match room two, and create a relationship to them. So here's our relational database for this actually rather trivial problem. It's gotten kind of, you can hardly see the dungeon behind it. <laughs> it's gotten a little complex. And, and frankly, the blue color I chose over there is not nearly as good as the gray and the red and, and the gold. That's uh, probably the biggest problem with this, uh, this, this model. So this is our relational database so far. Here's our graph so far. This is probably looks familiar, right? It looks like what it is, right? The graph has got rooms in it, and they are connected in ways that are intuitive. Uh, this room leads to this room, which leads to another room. It kind of looks like what it is. I actually, in some ways, feel like this is object-oriented, because I'm thinking about nouns. All the nodes are nouns, and like when you're doing OO programming, your, your classes tend to represent things, the instantiated classes, your objects, are the nouns of your system generally. And then the methods are the verbs. And, and with graph, it's kind of like the nodes are the nouns. And then the relationships are the verbs. And um, I, it just feels like it maps so neatly to my problem domain. I, I find graph just to be, it just sort of has this intuitive beauty to it. Sorry, I'm waxing poetic. <laughs> but now that we have a graph, this graph full of um, these rooms and these monsters and these treasures, let's do uh, some more interesting queries. And I'm just gonna do the, uh, the graph queries this time. I'm not gonna do SQL equivalents because, because they, they won't fit on the screen. <laughs> and this is, this is where graph databases start to shine. You can use this little star right here to say, match n number of leads to relationships to get to the destination node. So now instead of saying matching a room that connects to a room or a room that contains a treasure, I can say match a room that connects to a room or a room that connects to a room that connects to a room, room that connects to a room that connects to a room that connects to a room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, needless to say, this could be an expensive query. If you've got 20 nodes in your graph, that are all rooms, and you say, give me all permutations of paths from every room to every room, 
That's a lot of permutations. <laughs> Not going anywhere for a while. <laughs> um, and so this is an expensive query to run. There are ways to optimize it. And if some of you may have come to this, have this question brewing in your head saying, so what if my graph is just a circle of rooms? Isn't there an infinite number of permutations? Well, yes, there are. <laughs> I, I will tell you that uh, all the graph databases are aware of that problem, and they will not like, like they'll, they'll not circle around multiple times. So you'll get a subset of that infinity. You can also limit this and say, well, I don't want as far as it can go. I want to go from one to, say, three. So this particular query would find rooms that are one hop away up to three hops away. So you can limit this. And so this lets you do queries like, hey, I'm in a room in the dungeon. I want to find rooms nearby that I might want to go to. And so to do that, I would match a room with an ID of one, leads to one or two hops away, another room. And then I return that destination room, R, I get the ID and the name. This will give me a list of all the rooms that are nearby. Now I've got a menu to choose from. Where do I want to go? That could be useful if you're dungeon crawling. I can get more specific. I don't care about the room if it doesn't have gold in it. Same basic query. Here I'm matching a room, ID of one, presumably that's the room I'm in, that leads to one or two tops away, another room, but that room has to contain a treasure. So the match is getting a little more sophisticated. Return the ID of the room, the name of the room, the value of the treasure. And, you know, let's go ahead and order it descending so I know which room has the most valuable treasure. And let's just get the top one from the list. So give me a, a give me the most the nearest room to me that has the most value. Give me a room that's up to two rooms away and give me the one that has the biggest treasure in it. So this is where I'm going next. You could query the longest path through the dungeon. So this query basically solves the traveling salesman problem, where um, you can say, give me all the rooms that lead to all the rooms. But it does something interesting here. This is a syntax I haven't shown you yet. Uh, you can take these paths. When you have a multi-hop path, you can capture them. And then you can use them as operands and functions to ask questions about it. So this here is matching basically all the paths from room to every room to every room in the dungeon. And it's assigning all those paths to a variable p. And then I can return here uh, the nodes that are in that path. I can return how long that path is. I could return, I, I don't in this one, but I could return the relationships in that path. And then I'm ordering them by length descending. So the longest path is at the top which is gonna be the one that hits every room. And then I limit it to one, so I just see that one. So this lets me be a completionist and hit every room in the dungeon. I can find the room with the biggest treasure. So here I'm matching treasures, assigning them to treasure nodes, assigning them to the variable max. And then I'm using, a, I'm using the width to do a, uh, an aggregation. In this case, I'm getting the room that has, the, I'm getting the value of the maximum treasure. Give me the value of the biggest treasure in the dungeon. So all the treasure nodes, apply a max aggregator, give it a, a little alias there of max GP. Now I've got a variable I can use later on in my query. So I'm gonna match all the rooms that contain treasures. And then I'm gonna say where the gold piece value of the treasure in that room is equal to the gold piece value of the biggest treasure. Now, if there's a tie for first place, you'll get two results back in this query. And then I just return those values. So this lets me find big treasure. Play big games, win big prizes. I can combine all of this together to create 
something that rivals some of the worst SQL queries that I've ever written, <laughs> uh, where I'm matching the max treasure and getting that maximum gold piece value. And then I find all the rooms that contain treasure where it has that, and I assign that as my destination. And then I get a path from the room that I'm starting in to the room I want to stop in. And the room where uh, I start is just hard coded. And the destination is what I just queried as that room. And then I can return the nodes and the length. And then I can order that ascending so the shortest path bubbles to the top because there's going to be multiple paths that are going to match this. And then I limit it to one so I see that shortest path. So this is the slow version of the shortest path algorithm through the graph. This will work. It, I'm going to try and demo it. It might work on my MacBook. <laughs> the better way to do that is uh, this way. So this is doing a similar thing, uh, but we're just calling a function that is specifically designed to solve this problem as part of Redis Graph, which does the shortest path. And you just give it a, a matcher that says start to stop. And uh, so this is more performance, a lot, a lot more performance. So that's a lot of queries. It's a bit of a, a bit of a syntax dump, I know. Um, let's do a demo. Are we ready for a demo? Do we want to see this? That this thing is real and not just a bunch of talk. Let's see if I can. Okay. Yes, you're seeing what you need to see. Oh my God, we're seeing behind the scenes. Yeah. So I have written. I've got uh, Redis stack installed on my MacBook. I think I've got it running. No, I don't. Docker compose up dash D. No, we don't need to detach it. So I've just got a Docker image. It's got Redis stack. Redis stack is open source Redis with a bunch of common modules. One of them is Redis graph. There's search, there's JSON, there's uh, time series and Bloom. And it's just extensions, plugins that make Redis do more things, adds new data types and stuff. One of them is a graph database type in a key. So I've got my, I've got that running. And I've got some code here that I've written. We're not gonna go too deep into the code. Um, it's all on GitHub if you wanna check it out. But what it does is it generates a random dungeon. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and run it, like running npm start. And it's done. How's that for a demo? <laughs> Yay! Um, now we're, we're gonna go query this, right? So um, actually let's write some code to query it first and then I'll do the, 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 the fancy bubble thing so you can actually see it graphically. So I've got a little demo.js here I've written. And so all this does is, um, this is kind of show you a little bit how the code works, but it's not complicated. So I'm, I'm just using Node Redis. I'm, I'm using JavaScript because because I hate my life. <laughs> On the plus side, it does mean I get to go home at night and drink. So, so uh, I'm just creating a client here. I'm saying if there's an error, log it. I'm connecting. I am using a Node's new top level await feature, which came out in, I think, 14.8, which is kicks muchos asias. It's fantastic. Um, and then here I'm saying using Redis, Node Redis's client. It's got a dot graph dot query, and that's a command in Redis, it's a graph dot query. I pass in the key that contains my graph, I uh, called mine dungeon, because imagination. And then I pass a query, just like I was showing you earlier, the same query. So I'm matching a room where uh, the room ID, it's a different syntax here, we're saying ID of room. Uh, you can, ID is a function, you pass it a node, it will give you the ID of it, or if you pass it a relationship, it'll give you the ID of it where that equals one. So this will return room number one. And then it gets returns the name and uh, the ID. And so if I run this little bit of code, npm run demo, we can see that uh, I get back headers of name and ID, which is what I set up here. Uh, the room number one is the red jail. Although as an American, that doesn't feel like how jail should be spelled. <laughs> And as there's the ID of one. And then we can see that it returned a response in a quarter of a millisecond, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, it's local. I mean, it's going to be fast, right? And so we could put uh, any query we want in here. Like we could say uh, match. Let's do match. 
let's do sort of the match start, the start at star match n. Just get rid of the where, and we'll just return n. I'm not sure what this is going to do actually. I mean, I know what this does, but I'm not sure. I haven't tested this variation with this sample code before. There we go. Oh, look, it's arrays. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's data in there somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was a delightful little response, wasn't it? It's, it's like that. It's like that na 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 Batman video that was on the internet and was real popular for a while because JavaScript. Well, let's let's go ahead and do this query somewhere that it might look a little nicer. And so I'm going to use Redis Insight, and I, I'm, this is Redis Insight one. Uh, Redis Insight two is out, but it, they haven't added the. It's still a preview, and they haven't added the cool graph features that are in, in Redis Insight one yet, to it yet. So I'm going to do match n return n here. Is that font big enough, by the way? It should be reasonably big. And I'm just going to go ahead and full screen this. So this is giving me the entire graph. And it actually is showing me the relationships as well. And this, this just looks cool, right? Because I can like grab these nodes and drag them around. And it's just kind of a fun little demo. But I can double click on these. You see that here's all the randomly generated rooms. This is the name of my dungeon here. Uh, let's see if I can scroll down and see it, or zoom in and see it. The Deep Castle of Sardana Lux. I don't. I've got a random fantasy name generator here, and so it generates some really weird stuff. Um, let's let's run it again and see if we get a different uh, dungeon. And we'll just refresh this query. And now, we zoom in. This is hard to do on the touchpad. <laughs> it's the, the dim caverns, caverns of glass muzz. <laughs> it's, it's always kind of fun, the random names that this thing comes up with. And um, if, we, if we do like a more basic query, let me... Uh, Let's see, match uh, D dungeon. I, my, my sample graph does not exactly match up to the, the, the ones in the slide. I actually created a dungeon node and it has entrances, exits to rooms. But if we match uh, all the nodes of type dungeon, which there will be only one, and return it, then um, we just get that one node. And that's the dim, cav dim caverns. But if I double click on this, there's the rooms. There's the black chamber, the painted pit, the vile stairs. The vile stairs contains a lot of treasure. Oh no, no, it's, it's not treasure. It's monsters. It contains a lot of monsters, including Bear Andre, the Displacer Beast, two gnolls, and Panesia, something, the giant ant. I guess that's probably the Displacer Beast's pet. I don't know. <laughs> And I could go to the black pit, and then it shows me more relationships, and I can kind of walk around with this tool, which is, it's, it's actually kind of cool, right? <laughs> it makes it really visual. I mean, obviously visual isn't useful for coding. It's good for visualization. It's kind of in the name. Uh, but if we wanted to look at the actual data that I got back from this dungeon query, you can click over here and say, here's the, the data. So like if I wanted to match all the rooms, let's, uh, Say match r colon room, return r, enter. That's just going to give me all the rooms. But if I go to the tabular view, then here's all the rooms and their names. Actually, it's paginated, so there's the rest of them. So you know we can get like meaningful results out of this for for like, like actual work, right? <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's my little demo there. Uh, this code's all in GitHub, of course. So feel free to play with it. Um, I do love seeing, look at that, half a millisecond. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's all I got in the demo here. Yeah, let's get the slides back up here. I got 10 minutes. So we'll have time for questions, don't worry. Uh, I've talked about some of the practical applications. Obviously, Dungeons & Dragons is not a practical application for graph databases. And less your Hasbro than I suppose it is. Wizards of the Coast may actually, maybe they're using this for D&D Beyond, I don't know. 
Um, but social networks are sort of like the canonical example because a social graph is very tied to this sort of model. I mentioned genealogy as well. It's sort of a social graph over time with people you may or may not like. Um, transportation networks, I mentioned those as well. Um, you know, you, you can do these path inquiries and find like uh, the best path based on traffic conditions even. And uh, the one that kind of, I didn't mention that's kind of neat is logistics. So if you're trying to figure out where the E. coli tainted spinach came from, because that's a problem, um, and you've got a graph that represents all the farms, all the trucks, all the warehouses, all the, uh, um, all the stores, and you're like, well, people who got sick bought it at this store. You could do a graph query and find all the farms that spinach could have came from. And, uh, and of course, there's the most obvious one, which no one wants to talk about, which is contact tracing. <laughs> Uh, that's a totally, I mean, it's actually a really simple problem to solve with graph because it's got, it's got two types. It's got a node, which is people, and it's got a relationship, which was we're in the same place, and that's it. Right? <laughs> and so uh, that's another good graph application. Hopefully, we don't have to use it as much as we, we did. So lots of practical applications. I actually think that if, you're, uh, if you've got a properly scoped app, Graph is not a bad candidate for a lot of things, things you wouldn't necessarily think would be obvious. More mundane things that you were like, I'm just gonna put this in a relational database. It's like, you could use a graph database to do that uh, because it does map neatly to your problem domain. Um, I've, I've been noodling on doing a talk I was gonna call like graph, graph, and graph attorneys at law. Um, and the idea was, is I was gonna use a graph database to store my database, to store my data. And then it's gonna have an object graph of my objects in memory and then I was gonna expose that using GraphQL. But I suspect that I just wouldn't need the layer in the middle. And then I could probably just build an adapter on top of Redis Graph that exposes a GraphQL result. But I haven't done the experiment, so we'll see. Here's some resources for you to go check out. Um, you can tell I edited my slides this morning to make them better because there's a weird gap between Redis and Redis stack. Uh, but uh, there's, if you want to learn more about uh, Redis in general, you can go to redis.io. If you want to learn about Redis Stack, which is Redis with a bunch of modules, that's also out on redis.io at docs stack. Uh, you can install it as a Docker image like I did. You can do it in the cloud. You, you can do it all the ways that you would want to do it. There's even a brew install. Uh, Redisgraph.io, if you want to find out the details on uh, the, the Cypher query language and what parts Redis Graph specifically supports. Uh, there's a spec out there from uh, Neo4j for the Cypher query language and the open Cypher spec. And then here's a link to a blog post that I wrote um, a couple of years ago, which is sort of the inspiration for this talk. You do not have to worry about capturing this because I have conveniently given you a QR code that you can scan. This QR code is totally reliable. It will never give you up, nor will it let you down. <laughs> It actually does take you to the repo. I, I want to rickroll you so badly, but I just can't in good faith do it. <laughs> and um, I've been working for Redis for uh, uh, die four minus one years. So please go check out some of our stuff. We've got a Discord server, uh, which I'm always on, except when I'm at NDC, I'm, then I'm never on there. Uh, we got free classes at Redis University. And uh, you can set up a cloud version of Redis stack or just Redis Redis uh, out at redis.com slash try free. That's what I've got. Um, thanks a lot. I've got time for, we've got about five minutes for questions, I think. Yes? Can you create uh, the same relations uh, two relationships of the same type in the same two nodes? So, room A leads to room B and it's 40 meters away. Room A leads to room B and it's 80 meters away. I don't think so, because uh, the way the graph store, uh, so the question was, is can you create the same relationship with the same type, uh, but with different data? So can I have a, like, uh, I follow you, and then maybe there's some other number associated with that, and then I follow you again and some other number. I, I'm not positive uh, with Redis Graph specifically. I don't think so, though, because the way it's stored internally um, is with a sparse matrix. And so, so one way to model a graph, I don't have any slides on how these work internally, but there's two ways to model graphs internally. One is you can have a bunch of linked lists. And then the linked list says this uh, for each node. And it says this node, here's all the nodes it connects to. And so you do a lot of O of N operations over those lists to find things. It doesn't scale very well, it's slow. Uh, the other way is you can use a matrix where you've got 
all the nodes and all the nodes, and then you got a number, numeric value that says they're related. It's kind of like when you look at like a, for, for in the before times when we used paper maps, before the iPhones came out, uh, you would have these little charts in there would say distance from like, you know, Bristol to London, if you're driving, and it would, you know, give you a number. And then they look like that. And it would be for every node in the graph. And the problem with that is that space complexity grows quickly. Every single time you add a node, you're doubling it. Or whatever, whatever the math is. I think it's doubling. It's a lot. <laughs> and um, what Red Redis Graph does is using a sparse matrix, which is sort of a compressed version of that matrix. And because it's a matrix, I don't think you could put the same type multiple times because it would they'd overlap each other. So, so I, my money's on it won't work, but I haven't tried it. Good question. Other questions, over there. Yeah, the question is, is basically, can you put a value on a, on a relationship between two nodes? The answer is yes, you can. And you can query on that in the same way that you query on the nodes. I have found that when I want to put a lot of values on a relationship, it usually means I want a new node. And so I, I, and, um, it's just what I've sort of discovered in playing with, with, with these tools. And mind you, I haven't built any proper production code with this. I'm, I'm a developer advocate. I don't do real work. <laughs> but... Um, but what I found is, is generally, like I was, I was doing on stream, I was building what I was calling Redis Mud. And so I was building this dungeon, but I was gonna build a text-based multi-user dungeon uh, online. And I'm like, well, we got rooms and there's relationships, which are the connections between the rooms. And I quickly realized that I had another node type, which was door. And so, uh, but yeah, you can put those values on there and you can filter on them. So there are ways to do that. So you could say, well, wait this, this distance and say, well, how much traffic's on this road? And then, okay, well, then that changes which is the shortest path because it's not really the shortest number of hops now. It's the shortest total value of the uh, relationships in that line. Great question. I saw another question over there somewhere back there. Over there. We'll go there. Uh, the question is, can you create the same reciprocating relationship when you create a command? Um, there's, there's one way that I'm positive you can do it. There are instances where you can use double-headed arrows. Like when you're matching and you say, I don't care what direction the relationship is. It can go either way. You can use a double-headed arrow in a query. I don't think you can do that when you're creating. But you can create a node with a relationship, give it a variable, and then reference that variable a second time. So if I have like a room and I want to put a monster, if I have a room and I want to connect it to another room, I could say room one, and then room two could be referenced on either side of it. So you can do that. Right there. So the question is, is there any real way to infer relationships like a bulldog is an animal and it's also a type of dog, that sort of thing? There's, there, there's sort of two ideas there. Um, one idea is, is that relation, nodes can have multiple labels. So I could make a node that has a label of animal, a label of dog, and a uh, label of bulldog, which actually kind of lends itself, it, it's reminiscent of object inheritance hierarchies in object-oriented programming languages. I think there could be some value in doing that. Probably about as much as there is in using inheritance over composition. But, <laughs> but uh, the other thing, I think this is more what you might be hitting at, is that graphs are ways of representing object graphs. Like, you know, so I've got a node that is an animal. I've got a node that is a dog. I have a node that's a bulldog. And then I can create relationships between them. And I can put weights on those to say how tightly related they are. And then you can, do queries on those relationships and get an idea of how closely related concepts are. Or like you can do it for content recommendation. Like you've got, uh, well, this person's really in the JavaScript and JavaScript's kind of like TypeScript. He, he's, uh, well, wait. <laughs> sorry, I, I, did, did I offend everyone? <laughs> but, but you know, if you, you know, so if you, you like this, you might like this other thing. It's kind of, it's kind of the same problem as uh, recommending friends. 
because they're, what they're doing is they're looking at the density of the, rel the relationships between nodes. So uh, if I'm connected to you on, on Facebook, and then you've got a bunch of friends, and I'm connected to most of them, but not all, all of them, you can, there's, a, you know, there's a, a lot of relationships there, and you can count them and say, well, if this is really high, then you probably know this person over here too. So it's a similar sort of problem. So I think we're out of time for questions. Uh, happy to chat out in the uh, lobby afterwards as well. But uh, thanks a lot, everyone. You've been a fantastic audience. And I mean that in a totally pandering way. <laughs>